everyone. Uh, we're back again. Uh, we're going to be doing this video on uh, the low uh, profile sign plate that we've been working on. And uh, uh, the last video we uh, heat treated the parts to give you an update what uh, took place there. Uh, we heat treated those with some uh, matte gas torches. And I was a little concerned because I was using two torches and I can tell I wasn't getting the heat that I want because the color tells you everything when you heat treat. I was getting just past, a little bit past the cherry red, but to get these to a proper heat treat, I really wanted to get to that kind of that uh, glowing orange uh, color before I quenched them. So I took these and they checked the rock well. With the file, I could tell they were a little bit hard, uh, but I wouldn't actually check them on a, a rock well uh, tester, and they were at uh, the low 50s, and I wanted them harder than that. So what I did is I, I reheat treated them, but uh, what I did was I, I got some fire brick. You can buy that down at your local hardware store. And I just kind of set it up like so. Uh, you can set a third one in there. Uh, you can even put a top if you want. Have your wire. And, and then I was just heat and treat by, with my torch down here and just dangling the part in. And believe it or not, uh, because I trapped the heat and this brick would reflect the heat, I, I could use just the bigger torch and a heat treat. I could get the color that I wanted. I knew I was going to get good results. And uh, so when I checked them this time, <coughs> this one, uh, when I drew it back with a torch, it was a little bit lighter color than what this one was. This one was right at 58 Rockwell. This one was at 60 Rockwell. Uh, so what I did... I wanted to take all the stresses out and you can draw these back over and over and over and, and it will help with taking the stress. I just threw them in the oven at 500 degrees and uh, uh, they came out a little bit darker. Uh, when I checked the Rockwell I was right at the 57, 58 Rockwell mark on it. So that's, that's pretty good. That's right where I want to be. Uh, I don't want them so uh, hard that they'll be brittle in these weak areas. Uh, but yet I want them hard enough that they uh, have some good wear. And this is a prototype I'm making out of 01. <clears throat> I've already cut some steel to make some out of uh, CPM1V. I decided to go with 1V rather than uh, the 3V uh, because uh, the 1V is a lot tougher. And uh, you got thin sections right here and you're going to want the toughness. Now with the 1V, uh, it will be about almost as tough as S7, which is one of the toughest steels out there. And its wear resistance will be better than A2 and just a little bit less than D2. It approaches D2. So anyways, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to move over to the surface grinder. And we're going to take these two pieces. And we're just going to do a rough grind uh, to get them uh, so that we can get them where they're square. I'm not concerned at this point about the finish. I'm just concerned about getting them flat, getting all the bows out. Uh, getting them squared up, uh, getting them prepped up so that I can clamp them to a block uh, when we go to the jig grinder putting the hose in. When I go to the jig grinder and put the hose in, I'm going to establish that four inches. I already know that my jig grinder is going to cut at a little bit of a taper. I have work to do on it uh, uh, one of these days when I can get to it. Uh, but what will be interesting, it's not going to be that much, uh, but I'll, I'll show you how you can take and uh, that out in the finished grind will we'll grind uh, the bar uh, to the rolls. So with the jig grinder my main focus is going to be focusing on the four inch center to center. start using this Radiac uh, Ruby, the 46 grit. Uh, this one is a G hardness, that one's an H. Uh, that one has a, a little bit harder bonding. We're going to use this because it has this open structure uh, as we covered in some earlier videos. And what that will do, it will give me a very free grind. Uh, it will generate extremely low amounts of heat. And so some parts of this I'll be grinding without coolant, 
and uh, other parts I'll be grinding with coolant but this is the wheel that will work nice for that on the finished grind uh, this one kind of face off that but that's a radiac and it's a 46.2 grit and this is just a good general purpose wheel it'll leave a a little bit better finish on it and it will do a real nice job on cleaning them up and uh, the finish that you can get with that you'll be amazed if you watched our video uh, grinding wheels and surface finishes uh, we showed that if you do things proper you can take a 46 grit wheel and you're going to get a better finish than you're going to get off of a 120 grit 150 grit and we cover the uh, issues in that it's the grit size really doesn't play a whole lot in your finish there a lot of times people think that the finer grit in the grinding wheel is going to give them better finish basically the finer grit what that does is if you want to hold a tighter radius in the corner of your parts that's when you want to switch to your uh, fine grit wheels it works good for that kind of stuff I use a cluster diamond the cluster diamond six straight up I go under the center of the wheel I like these because they last, if you use them proper, they'll last and uh, way longer than a single point diamond. I, uh, the way I dress my wheels, I actually get a better finish with them and uh, they're not as finicky. A single point diamond, uh, they're a little bit harder to maintain. These, these clusters, if you have an opportunity to get one of these with a fine cluster, uh, I think you'll like it. What we're going to do when we uh, start on this, I generally like using the wider surfaces, but because I got the shape over here with the radiuses, there's really no way to hang like that. If you flip over here, then you're going to have to put flats on there. It's not going to hold. Uh, so the surfaces are pretty close. I'm going to just start grinding uh, on this. Uh, I'm just going to grind off these surfaces. I'm going to hold them at an angle because I got length. Uh, so I'm going to have this instead of straight. If I hold it straight and as I grind over here, uh, when that wheel hits the steel, <coughs> it's generating heat. And if I generate heat the whole length over here, uh, it's going to give it a whole lot more opportunity uh, to cause a heat warp in there. By turning it at an angle, when I'm cutting across here, my heat signature on the part isn't very great less opportunity for heat to do the damage and in grinding when you're doing precision grinding anybody that's done that you'll know right away that, that controlling that heat is a very important thing to do we're gonna set our magnet we're gonna set it low because this could be warp <coughs> we're gonna set our magnet uh, low so that it won't pull the part and flex it if, it, if it's got a bow it will suck it right down to the magnet. We're going to use a low magnet to compensate for that. So generally when we do something like that I'll, I'll take a cleanup cut, I'll flip it over and now that side it still may have some bow in it even with a light magnet depending on how bad the uh, uh, or, uh, warpage was. But then I'll take a cleanup cut on that side and that will take out even less. I'll flip it over and each time you flip this you take more and more of that bow out and the more bow you get out uh, uh, you need a lot more pressure on the magnet or a lot more powerful magnet in order to actually seat it down. The other thing take your part if it's like this and rub it on your magnet. I can tell that I'm hitting on these points here. If I take it and flip it over this way I can tell that that there's a little bit of bow and it's in the middle. <clears throat> when you're trying to get a low magnet, uh, this is something that's just going to be acquired with time and experience. Uh, you want that uh, so that I, I can still move that but it's still tight enough I think I'm going to get away with it and no matter how experienced you get you're going to get an occasional part that will fling off you can block things in if you want but I prefer to just let it slide on these things uh, a lot of times if you try to block some parts especially the long and skinny parts 
sometimes what will happen if they're blocked in and you get more magnetism that's holding tighter on that part, the part will lift up and then it's, it's, it's a, a worse situation. I'm just touching, I'll set my digital, I'm going to back off about three thousandths and before I turn the coolant on I'm just going to come across, I just want to see where I'm at so whatever bow I have it's less than three thou Come down to a thou and a half from where I was touching. And you can see I'm just touching right now, right there in the middle. So I got about a thou and a half bowl in this part. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn the coolant on. And I'm not going to take very aggressive bites because I'm not holding very tight on the magnet. I'll take about five tenths at a time. I can put guarding to get the coolant splash from uh, coming at me over here. I'm not too concerned about that. If I do that, it'll block the view a little bit. So we'll just live with it for now. Maybe turning the volume down a little bit on the coolant there will be okay. So that was our zero. Uh, I went five tenths from where we touched. We'll see what it looks like from here. Looks like this end is almost cleaned up. Right now I got this end almost clean up. This end it's a little bit uh, more I need to take off. But I'm just going to wind down a couple tenths from here uh, and clean this because I'm going to flip back to the side again. And so I can take more. I know I'm going to take more off here shortly. Right now I just want to work that bow out and get it flat and parallel. Getting it flat and parallel is going to be the harder uh, or the more important issues that you need to work on. Another thing, the wheel that I'm using over here, uh, it cuts very free. If I was using another wheel uh, with a finer grit, 
I'd be throwing this part off. I would not be able to get away with this light magnet hold using the wrong wheel. So your wheel selection is very important when you're doing this type of work. What you want is something that's going to generate very little heat, something that cuts free. Generally what you'll find a lot of times if you're cutting something like this, if you don't have it set at an angle, and you have it set straight this way, as it gets in the middle it heats up and it bows up, when it bows up the part pulls into the wheel. When it pulls into the wheel, uh, it starts grinding, generate more heat, bows more, and then next thing you know your part has been flinged off the end. You make a loud crash and all your co-workers uh, they decide they need to come over and check out what all that loud noise was about. And it's kind of embarrassing. Step out and take your air hose to that a minute. One of the other things that you always want to focus on when you're grinding and you want precision you got to make sure that your magnet has no dirt, no felt. If you use rags or even these paper towels, a lot of times that will leave little particles and stuff. Your best thing is a clean hand running across here. You might get a thin oil film on there, but uh, you won't have a particle build up under it. And when you flip it over, you want to turn it or, or move it around. You can feel if there's any, the slightest little bit of stuff, you'll be able to feel if it's under there. And as you can see, now that I got that side kind of flat, it's holding a lot tighter. So I'm going to have to adjust this magnet again. Yeah, so it's going to be tighter, and uh, with an electromagnet that's a variable uh, field on there, it worked really nice for this kind of work. Robin Renzini just uh, picked up a surface grinder that he's going to be uh, doing some future YouTube videos, and that uh, uh, he's going to be rebuilding this thing and getting it good, and he's got an electromagnet on there rather than your manual one, and he, he's worked them before. He knows what I'm talking about, but... Uh, you'll love it, the electromagnet over the manuals. Now I just took five tenths off. And if you can see, I just touched at this end, and I touched at that end. Everything in the middle is low right now. I'm going to reset my digital, and we'll just see how low it was compared to the other side. Again, not taking big bites. Take big bites, you're asking for trouble with light magnet holds. Other thing that works real nice with this uh, open structure on this wheel it's extremely hard to load it up so if once it starts loading up you're going to generate more heat you're going to have trouble uh, with the part wanting to distort on you 
I'm putting stresses, heat checks, all the different things in there. So, so when you're doing this type of work, uh, especially for the rough grinding on there, a wheel selection very important. You can always get the thing flat, parallel, square, and you can switch to a, a different wheel to get your finish. For this being 01, being oil quench, or oil quench, they actually come out pretty flat. Very little bow, at least in this direction. It's the thicker section, so I, I may have more bow in the other direction. almost two thousandths to clean up uh, the whole thing right here. It just took that last little bit out of the middle. That's not too bad. Maybe one other thing that to point out. Uh, we cleaned this side up in two thousandths. Uh, for me, doing a lot of grinding, I think it's important uh, that when you do the mill work on this that you get that as flat as you can because it's a lot easier to get the flatness over the mill than to struggle and work with it many times here at the grinder. I think a lot of people that start out in the trade and they start out on chip makers and machining I don't think they develop the, the finesse and the accuracies the setups that you need uh, to get some of this stuff flat, parallel, and square. Uh, my dad always said that uh, when he trained people that he always liked to train them on the grinding, the finishing end of things. And he says that always helped them when they moved over to the chip making part, mills, lays, uh, to understand what's required to make a part where it grinds up real nice and perfect. They understand how to do their steps. They understand the importance of the square. Uh, the flatness, all of those things, and if you apply that at the beginning of the project when you're making chips, and it's not hard to do, it's actually your work will go faster, more accurate, uh, it really pays off in the end when you come to the finishing of it on a grinder. I took two tenths off over here. When I take my finish cuts, my semi finish cuts, you'll see that I'm doing a blank pass backwards. Uh, you see sparks, you're cutting steel. You hear it rubbing, uh, you're cutting steel. Uh, so if you just take one pass, it'll probably be pretty flat, but if you want that just uh, extra degree of precision, you want to take blank passes until you don't hear any uh, grind noise or you see any sparks. And then you're taking all the high spots off. And again, this is rough grinding. We want to parallel flat and square and uh, but at the same time it's just a good practice I could see the sparks uh, going in the reverse direction now I got this side hundred percent cleaned up the other side has a little bit I need to clean up yeah, but as I said earlier what we're doing we're working any bow out and so I'm gonna flip and I intended to flip on that <coughs> to do this side again anyhow just to get the accuracy. I'm going to go blow this off and be right back. You can see by putting that at an angle we got very little cross section that we're touching. Very little opportunity for heat to build up. I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but my experience over here in West Michigan, uh, to find someone who 
has a very good ability to grind to a high degree of accuracy. It seems like many of the shops around here have a hard time finding that. And it seems like it's been that for quite some time. Uh, to get something parallel, flat, and square to a high degree of accuracy, and a few little tricks in it. It takes some patience, it takes some time, and and in my experience, most people seem to rather make chips than they do grinding. And actually, I'm I'm kind of that way too. But but uh, my father, uh, you know, he's probably one of the best surf uh, surface grinding individuals. Grind. Uh, can surface grain better than most people. Uh, he drilled some of this stuff in me at a very young age. If you're doing just top and bottom flat grinding, it can get boring. When I do a lot of grinding, I, I used to do a lot of form grinding. <coughs> that was more interesting because you would be dealing with radiuses and dealing with angles. But in today's world where they got wire burners, uh, they have hard turn. Uh, there's not a whole lot of that form grinding taking place and I'm afraid that the way things are going uh, that to have a person who can surface grind uh, do some of these difficult parts like they did in the past I, I think they're dying breed and I think uh, soon there's not going to be very many left that's going to be able to do it because of the technology that we have out there now we're taking our last pass right here. And then we'll check to see how flat it is. I've worked a lot of CNC equipment. I've never ran a CNC grinder. I have no experience on that. I've always had my curiosity up. Uh, just to see how one of those would work. I've watched a few YouTube videos on there. They look pretty neat. When you come to manual surface grinders and the skill sets that are required to do that, I, I think when these old timers uh, kind of retire out, I don't think we're going to see that too much in the future. Okay. We got the first side. Second side. Let's uh, clean it off and let's stick it under the indicator and see what we have. As you can see, that come out really nice. Uh, there's no bow in that side. If you had bow, you'd see that indicator moving. You see that needle's not even moving. And you have no bow. So now we know just by what we just did with this indicator and checked, we know that this is flat and parallel, uh, these two sides. Uh, they're right on the money. They're really good. What we're going to do next, we're going to set this part up on this cube. <coughs> And we're going to set it up so that we can grind uh, two edges on there. This is the part I'm going to grind dry. I'm going to take a little bit of time here uh, to get the set up. And I'm thinking right now we're probably going to have to do uh, this uh, rough grinding as a, a separate video and do the jig grinding as a separate and then. Uh, We'll do the finish grind. So it'll probably be three more parts to this. Let's see. Let me pull this up over here. Here, here's another nice little thing. You can just take a block, a two by four block. Uh, I use these finger clamps. Uh, you can take and buy these from a lot of uh, places. <coughs> but anyways, uh. I just made me a little board where I can just put all the stuff together, every all the components I need, the screws, uh, the clamps, the washers, the whole whole set, everything's right here. It makes it nice and easy for 
doing this type of work. Now what you want to do when you use a finger clamp, I always set it on a long way like that and then I'll screw down until I just hit and then I give it about a half a turn to a turn. With a quarter twenty if you do one full uh, turn you're going to get fifty thousandths uh, lift. And so the reason I do that is I want my clamp to be angled like that and I'm exaggerating but I want it to be angled like that. I don't want my clamp to be like this. If my clamp's like this, uh, and then I'm going to have more push, less control. Having it like that, uh, it gives you more control over what you, what you, uh, the distortions from your clamping. So what you do, I'll be using two clamps. Get both of them set. Another nice thing to have when you're using a cube like this is to have you something that you know is nice and square. And uh, that way you can uh, get it lined up pretty close. Oops, that one came loose. And what we're doing is we'll just snug those up. We'll not put a lot of pressure on them. What you want to do, you want to leave it so that this surface is higher than that surface and if I want to clean the end up over here, then I want this end sticking out a little bit so that's higher than that. That way when I flip my cube, if I grind this and it indicates nice and good after the grind, I flip over here, indicates good, I know that I'm as square as my cube. Got a little more bow on uh, this way. Let's see. There's. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to indicate this and balance the bow out. It's high in the middle. I'm zero here. About four thousandths high in the middle. Yep. Let's say. Come up. Smoke that side down a little more. Okay, zero. Now we're over four. And yeah, so we're about four or five thousandths high in the center. What you want to do now, you can come over and you can adjust the or tighten these a little bit tighter. But the thing I want to do at this point, <coughs> I want to establish that this is running flat in this direction. And 
it's moving just a little bit uh, low right here, high up here. And this is the beauty about using these finger clamps in the cube. If you want to get this real precision, you can loosen one of these up and move it a little bit forward. Tighten it down. And now we're just a little bit low on the front. The amount of pressure that you put on the positioning of the clamp, you can actually adjust this uh, and tweak it right in. And right now it's it's less than 50 millionths. I'm going to just tighten them down a little bit more. Recheck. This side's perfect. This side. Just a hero. Okay, now that one's just about perfect. That one's about perfect. <coughs> if your cube is nice, square, parallel and flat with all the sides, and you grind your part uh, where you read zero zero on your indicator it will be as square as what this cube is. Now this cube in about a four inch distance is probably less than fifty millionths of an inch as far as its square flatness and parallel. And so we still get zero and we're about yeah zero to one on the end it dips off really fast and it doesn't surprise me because you got some thin sections in there so what I'm going to do is I'm going to redress this wheel get a fresh dress on it uh, I'm going to grind this dry I'm going to grind it at an angle and uh, we'll get back and see how things work okay I redress the wheel and because I'm going to be dry grinding on this part I'm going to give a pretty good angle on it keep my heat signature low across there. At this point I'm going to turn my variable magnet all the way up. I want that block to stay good and I know that I'm high in the middle so that's where I'm going to touch off. Roughing this out, we're only going to take again about five tenths at a time, so it's going to take a little bit.
Another thing that will help with the heat uh, is in the, this axis. You want to spin fast. If you go, if you go slow, uh, you're going to end up generating a lot of heat in there. You want to scoop past her real nice and fast, just to keep that heat signature, especially without coolant, down as low as you can. I can feel a little bit of heat, not bad. What you can do, you can feel if there's a wheel spinning this way, you can feel there's a lot of uh, cool air circulating. So what you can do, uh, you can uh, wind your part out this way, let that cooler air circulate as you're winding backwards. Maybe just take your time with a little bit cool it down a little bit. Because this is warped so bad, I'll get it cleaned up and I'll probably redress that wheel and do a final pass on there. Yeah, the part actually not not bad at all. Uh, after all that cutting, it's it's not that bad. Uh, again, running it back pass and going slow on this end with all that, uh, it acts like a little fan that goes down on there. It, it takes that heat out. The reason I'm not using coolant is if anybody uh, has had experience grinding and you get all these holes in there, it it's just hard to get that coolant out of there. It takes you a lot of time and. Uh, I can get the part done faster uh, a lot of times doing it this way uh, than when I'm running coolant. It looks like we're just right there at almost 100%. I'm just going to go ahead and blank pass back. I'm going to redress the wheel after this. And we'll come back. And what we're going to do is we're going to just ink that surface up. Uh, we're going to work it in. Uh, we should have it flat within 50 millionths. One of the things I do at my full-time job, if I'm in grinding, and I'm grinding something like that, uh, in fact, they, they dry grind most everything they do. A lot of the times the coolant's not even hooked up on their grinders. I will set and, and position my work so it's where the air blast comes down, and then I just try to schedule my work so that I can use my bathroom brakes or I can uh, take and uh, do some calculations or some other things or get some other parts set up and just let it set right down there for a few minutes and let that air blast stabilize the temperatures and that actually works pretty nice and if you do this right even without coolant using the right wheels 
you can get those things really flat. They're hard. You just got to follow a few uh, principles here, and you can do it. And it's about controlling the heat, and that's what surface grinding really is about. To do a good job on grinding, there's so many variables involved, and you just got to control as many of those variables as you can. Uh, heat's a variable here. Uh, your wheel selection's a variable over here. Uh, your magnet power, that's a variable. Uh, the angle that you set, that's a variable. So everything uh, to grind something, get the tolerances uh, that are extremely precision, the squareness, perilous, flatness, again, that all boils down to controlling the variables. Uh, the variables such as the diamond that you use, uh, variables how fast that you're uh, traversing as you're dressing your wheel, all of that will play a huge effect on, on the results uh, that you're trying to achieve with the grinder. <clears throat> okay, I just uh, redressed the wheel, got things set, I touched off, my touch was a little heavy but that's fine. I got a fresh dress on the wheel. I'll just come across there. I, I had a few little marks on the corner uh, yet anyhow, so being a little heavy on this first cut's not going to hurt. I'll get more of a 100% cleanup. No heat in the part that I can tell. <clears throat> right now, I'm going to get me a marker. And even though I can't feel that heat in there, I mean, it feels the same temperature. Uh, if it does distort with the heat, what's going to happen is going to be in the middle and, and it's going to be bowed like that. By taking a marker, We'll mark the surfaces up. That way I can tell what what's hitting, what's not hitting. And so I'll just mark the whole surface. <clears throat> I'm going to reset my digital. And we'll go from there. And what I'm going to try now, I'm going to try to get less than a tenth off. So... I just I moved it, the digital, I actually went a tenth right there, but it went 50 millionths. It's, and you can see it's, uh, it's barely touching right there. We've got some sparks coming across. Uh, it is taking the ink off, just barely. And it looks like it stayed pretty flat. And again, that, that is because of the wheel I'm using. If you use a different wheel that's not uh, similar to characteristics on that, it generates more heat, you're not going to have this kind of success. So probably one of the biggest variables to control would be the wheel selection. And I can see just a little bit of the ink back there. Bit more than likely, this settled just a little bit as it's coming across. So by taking a blank pass back, I can still see sparks. By taking a blank pass, I, I think that little bit of ink will just come right out. Oh, so I think it worked out pretty good on this part. A lot of times you gotta 
fiddle around a little bit at this point and take a few passes, but we might get it on the first try this time. One of the other variables that's important as well is the depth of cut that you take on your final dress with your diamond. Uh, it's not even, uh, well, it's the depth of cut as well as the direction. What happens is if you come across this way, you're grinding with one side of the diamond, you come across this way, you're grinding with the other. Uh, I always like to listen, and if it's loud one direction, and it's a lot quieter the other direction, I always finish in the direction that the wheels make the least amount of noise. We got just a touch of ink on there. It's extremely close. So I'm just going to take a blank pass on it and see what happens. In fact, I think it will be close enough. I'm not even going to worry about it. Again, we're in the rough grind. As long as 90% of that's flat, it'll do what I need. Just barely seeing sparks now. Just a little few flickers here and there. Well, let's move it to the granite. See what uh, it looks like. As you can see, you can see a little bit of faded ink over here, but like I say, everything else is nice and cleaned up. I'm not going to be too concerned about that. We'll see what it measures right now. We got uh, zero. I mean, it's it's hardly you can hardly see it moving. <clears throat> so we know that this surface, <coughs> excuse me, is nice and flat right now. There's no heat in the part. They feel the same temperature. Uh, what you want to do at this point, because we did take some bow. And sometimes if there's stresses and as you grind that bow out, it can release some stresses. We want to check and make sure that we're running <coughs> excuse me. Square this way as well. <coughs> yeah, so it's not even moving. <coughs> So this part right now is as square as what this block. What I'm going to do, it's a very little surface, but I'm going to want to grind it. I'm going to grind this surface right here because as I'm establishing the four inches from center to center, I need a good square, flat, and parallel surface on there. I'm going to grab a drink of water, uh, move back to the surface grinder, and then we'll cut that a little bit right there and get it nice and square too. As you can see, the needle's not even moving. <coughs> so we have this surface, this surface, and these two surfaces all square, parallel, and flat with each other is as good as what this block is. I love using these blocks. <coughs> they come in so handy for this type of work and the precision that you need. And uh, <coughs> 
you know you can adjust things with the pressure on the finger clamp you can tweak things down to 50 millionths without a problem one other thing I could have done on this uh, block I could have set this up and I could have just lightly ground this surface a little bit and then I could have took some uh, uh, countersunk blocks and, and use those tap toes and tighten them up on there so that those blocks would be let's see if I can find something you know this would be an exaggeration but if you had some blocks countersunk get two of those on there you can set it up and grind that surface leave that bolted flip over you can grind and then you can use your coolant and not worry about uh, the problem there too but I wanted to demonstrate uh, the versatility of, of the cube over here now on this part uh, we, we'll leave it just like this and then we'll move over to the jig grinding and we'll do that in another part of the video and we'll probably grind this off camera because the video's going on uh, we'll rough grind it maybe we'll do the finish grind on this one rather than this one show you the technique this one's going to be a little bit harder because it's much thinner the thinner you have uh, the harder it is to control the heat, uh, the distortions and everything. So it will be a more difficult part. But <clears throat> this is one where it would be very difficult to hold on the cube because of the thinness. So this is a case where I will default and use uh, the toolmaker vise to hold this and get that surface all nice and flat. One other thing you can do, if your grinder is real good, uh, you can grind this surface and I can even do that and then you can set this up and I should have enough overhang that I'd be able to grind and come across there I always hate grinding in that overhang though because sometimes you start getting to the limits of your grinder you get some distortion because you're generally not grinding there very much and, and if you got any wear it's in this area and it's fresh over here and sometimes it's, it's difficult this is a new grinder so uh, I probably wouldn't have as much trouble but anyways that was uh, <clears throat> some of the principles that I use for rough grinding I hope that you found the uh, video helpful uh, again we'll come to the finish grind we'll actually use this part on the finish grind uh, what we're gonna do off camera is rough grind this in we'll come back a little bit later uh, with a separate video and we'll jig grind both parts and uh, we'll play with the jig grinder and uh, we'll go from there and then we'll do another video uh, on the finished grind so I hope you enjoyed uh, thanks for watching